our call to worship this morning, I was thinking this week uh, about Tom's series and the full armor, and um, I literally f- flipped open and came to Romans 12, 9, and I was like, it just really is kind of hand in hand to think when I read this, that to have that armor on as he's preached to us, that message that God gives us is just makes it so revealing. So love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. And do not be conceited. Jesus, thank you for that message, and thank you for the word. Thank you for this body of Christ. Thank you for these voices and song, and thank you for the love that you continue to show us, and we can show others. And even when it's hard and challenging and struggles, and there's so much evil and just so many challenges, you you give us what we need that we can trust in you to have that armor on to be ready for, for what comes at us. Thank you for that. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name. You are here Moving in a mist I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart. I worship you, yeah, I worship you, Lord. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, 
That is who you are. That is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory. When I 
thought I lost me You knew where I left me Reintroduce me to your love You picked up all my pieces Put me back together You are the defender of my heart When I thought I lost me You knew where I left me Reintroduce me to your love You picked up all my pieces Put me back together You are the defender of my heart Hallelujah Save me so much better your way. Hallelujah, great defender. So much better your way. Hallelujah, you have saved me so much better your way. Hallelujah, great defender, so much better your way. Hallelujah, you have saved me, so much better your way. Hallelujah, great defender, so much better your way. And all I did was praise. All I need to do is worship. Lord, I will just bow down. I'm just gonna stay still Okay, you can be seated Thank you fellas Love that Brian, thanks for coming in on that last one That sounded really good Morning everybody we have got a little bit of family business to do before we go much further into the service. You know, like uh, when your kids graduate from primary school and move up to high school or something, you have a big special occasion. Well, this morning we are going to ordain a new deacon to serve in our church family. So I'd like to ask Chris Revis to come back up here and stand sort of in the middle here. And then anybody who is currently an elder or deacon, come on up and come behind him, and uh, we'll read him the ride. I mean, we'll tell him what he's supposed to be doing in the coming years, and then uh, ask him to walk through some of his uh, obligations. <clears throat> what does it mean to ordain someone? It does not mean that they now have been credentialed by some institution and they glow in the dark. That is not what it means. To ordain Chris to be a deacon in service to our church family uh, does not mean that he is holier than anybody else. But it does mean as we have looked at his life and nominated him to be a deacon, we see someone who moves towards people serving, caring, mercy, easily. They don't have to be jump-started by someone else. That's what a, a deacon is. So this morning, when we call him to the duties of being one of our deacons, we are asking him to work with the other team, the rest of the team of deacons and with us elders, to oversee the mercy ministries of this church to actually in the Constitution, our Constitution, it says they help lead us out into caring for our community out there in mercy and compassion 
and serving and giving. They help distribute our left-hand funds, uh, the money that we give to people who are in need. They help us work on our property. We don't own this property, but there's still things to do at times, so they help us with that. So that's sort of the big umbrella of what our deacons do. I think there are currently five or six this year, something like that. Five, five. So, um, Chris, in a minute I'm going to ask you to kneel down, but right now you can stand. Do you acknowledge and accept the call of God on your life to serve him in the diaconal ministries of Christ our Redeemer? Do you receive and accept these diaconal responsibilities to lead our church in the ministries of compassion, mercy, and service to one another and to our neighbors? Do you purpose to carry out these ministries in such a way that the loveliness and graciousness of our Lord Jesus Christ would shine through you in all that you do together? And do you solemnly promise and covenant today in dependence upon God that you will work together in love, in submission to one another, and to the elders that Christ calls into leadership in this church? Okay. And if you would kneel down, we're going to lay our hands on you, literally. Don't push down too hard, fellas. <laughs> um, any of you who want to, can pray over him. I'll get us started. And then, Debbie, would you close? Jesus, I thank you that when you get a hold of a man, you do something with their life that is beautiful and full of grace. And we've seen that in Chris. So we thank you for your life in his and the way that he does move towards people. We pray now, Lord, as we ordain him to this service as a deacon that he will continue to grow in Christ and to lead us in these mercy ministries. Amen. And I will send you his phone number tonight, and you can call him if you need anything done in your house at all. And, and I will ask <laughs> if you have any music at all. <laughs> Thank you all. Sidebar, just a little comment. It is delightful to me to hear children in our midst, okay? It is. It doesn't bother me at all. As long as it's a low roar... And, and they're not dancing in front of me. That's part of our church family. So, okay. Good morning, church. There we go. Good morning, folks in Fitzpatrick. And good morning, church in streaming land. We are glad you're with us. Um, just got a couple of announcements, and then we'll set the, set the captives free. Um, first of all, we're glad you're here. I see some uh, familiar faces and some, some visitors, so welcome. Uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, we have a men's breakfast, bros and bacon. Thought I'd try that one out. No? Okay. So men's breakfast coming on February 26th, so I believe that's two Saturdays from now, not next Saturday, but two Saturdays from now. 
Our guest speaker is going to be Mike Gimbola from the Blue Ridge Christian Counseling, from Blue Ridge Christian Counseling, and he's going to be talking about friendships, which if you're a man, or really if you're an adult, friendships is a very important topic. But if you're a man, a topic very germane to, to who you are and talking about friendships and how they've been a casualty of COVID. So um, there'll be bacon, there'll be bros, there'll be conversation, there'll be eggs, as well as juice. So at Chris Owens' house, Chris and Adrian Owens' house on the 26th at 8.30. So if you're interested, see uh, Chris, see Tom. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, if you are a visitor with us, we have an information table over there in the back, right where Heather's standing. Yeah, there you go. Um, if you're a visitor with us, please fill out a visitor card. We'd love to get information um, so we can sell it to our telemarketers. Um, but really... <laughs> Really, it's a good way for us to know who's been here and make contact with you. Um, so if you'd like to, please do that. And then lastly, every first Sunday of the month, the elders are calling together the church to pray. So every first Sunday of the month, 9 a.m., we meet next door, and we're praying for the transition. We're praying for everything. We're praying for Tom and Sherry. We're praying for the pastoral search. We're praying for where CORE is going to be in a year, a year and a half, two years, three years. It's the whole gamut. So it's not just a search committee thing. So we will invite everybody to show up first Sunday of every month, 9 a.m. next door. So the next one is going to be March 6th. So put that in your calendar. We're going to gather and pray. And that's all I have. So we're going to break. The adults can get up and have some coffee and food. And the kids, you're going to go to CORE Kids. So have fun, and we'll come back here in a few minutes.
Gee, that works surprisingly well. <laughs> That's great. We're going to spend some time now praying together in Ephesians 6, which is the passage we've been staring at for a while now. One of the ways that we arm ourselves in this battle is this. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. For alls. All the time. All kinds of prayer with all perseverance for all the saints. So as we spend some time now as a church family praying together, there are some things on our hearts that are urgent and feel critical. The Petersons, who are our missionaries in Cairo, Egypt, their entire family has got COVID right at this moment. So Joel, Elizabeth, Asher, Simeon, Nora, and Isaiah. I think I did that right. <laughs> They've all got COVID right at this point, and the parents are the worst in symptoms, so we are going to pray for them. In our own church family, cancer, COVID, chronic pain are plaguing some of us. You know who those people are. So when we come to pray in a minute, uh, I want us to actually pray for these people. I'm going to ask you to, to just jump in when there's a silence and pray for somebody. One of the things that I want to say right now is this idea successful praying. Banish that thought. Success at all in anything related to spirituality is the wrong idea. We never do anything successfully. That's importing stuff from the world. We just pray. So we're going to pray for these people. I also want us to pray for our spirits. You know, there is a spirit of cynicism rampant paging through our culture. Cynics. Pray against that. Paul, when he prays for the church, pray that your hearts would be strengthened. He prays that we would know Christ dwelling in our hearts, that we would know his love, his strength, and his power. So not just for healing, although that's important, but praying for our spirits, for the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst, making us quick, making us alive making us be who God calls us to be. So we're going to pray now. That doesn't mean I'm going to pray. <laughs> that means you're going to pray. We're going to pray together because we're a church family. So imagine you're all around your family table. And uh, before everybody rushes off to do schoolwork or jump in the car or whatever, you're going to have your dad say, hey, okay, guys, Let's pray about a few things. So that's what we're going to do right now before we get on to the next segment of our service. Okay? So you don't need to be invited any more than that. You don't need to raise your hand and take this or that or the other. We are going to pray now. Okay? And for those of you who are watching in streaming land, I'm sorry you probably won't be able to hear all of these things, but no that in the midst of our church family, prayer is important, and we are gathered for prayer. So let's pray together. Lord, I want to begin by asking you to uh, heal Joel and Elizabeth and their beautiful family, heal them of COVID. Lord, though, even in their weakness, pray that they would discover ways that you are with them in suffering that uh, is a beautiful thing. You are with us in those ways, unlike other ways. We pray, Lord, that even their weakness and vulnerability might be occasion for their neighbors to see them handling pain and suffering different. So, Lord, bless their ministry of the gospel in Cairo. Pray that this family will be used by you to bring others to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ.
Lord, we do know our weakness. We have a great shepherd. It's a good reminder that we are sheep. We stray, we're weak, we're defenseless. So, Lord, be our strength, be our guide, be our teacher. Even this day, Lord, as we <clears throat> continue ministry of your word and testimony this morning, Lord, we didn't come in here to be entertained or to be an audience, but to be challenged, to be encouraged, to be built up in our faith. So we ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Well done. Now, Heather, come on up with the scripture reading. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 14, and this is the ESV. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Got to mention that I'm recognizing the Colin and Kim and their young men who have come back to visit us. What's it been, five years, something like that? Vital part of our church family in years gone by. Welcome, glad you're with us. And there's other visitors as well this morning. We have a very special guest this morning, Andrew Seacrest. Come on up. He is the brother of uh, Dre who leads us in music. He also works for World Relief Agency, which is an international humanitarian agency that we're going to hear a lot about this morning. The other side of Andrew and his wife, Amy, you want to wave your hand there? Um, they live in a place inside the city of Baltimore intentionally to make a difference there. That's why I had... Heather, read that passage from Jeremiah 29. In case some of you want to go, where was that again? That was Jeremiah 29. It's a very important passage. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you. Because if it prospers, you prosper. Too often as Christians, we think about, well, maybe I'll get my coworker saved. But we don't think about the well-being, the prospering, the uh, flourishing of our neighbors in our city. So I have invited Andrew to come and we're going to do a little interview. Basically, I'm just going to lob some questions and let him kind of go at it and, and talk to you. And this is our main content today. Let's have a seat. And um, the idea here is that I've been praying that what he shares a, in an interview format actually challenges our hearts actually kind of confronts us today. Uh, no pressure or anything on that one, but uh, 
uh, sometimes the testimony of someone who's actually on the battlefront can really provoke us to think about how am I living my life? And if I'm thinking about buying a new house, sort of what are the bullet points of what I'm looking for and why? So that's where we're going today. I'm really, really, really grateful that we've been able to work this out. We tried once earlier and COVID clobbered us, so we didn't make it then, but very glad that you're here. I was going to say real quick, um, I'm a little bummed that you didn't invite me up a month from now when there was going to be the men's breakfast with all that good food, oh. so maybe next time. You can come back for Bacon Fest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, it, this is, yeah, I'm just going to toss some stuff out here. Um, to begin with, tell us a little bit about your journey. You're a native guy, but nobody accidentally ends up working for a humanitarian agency. So a little bit of the journey that kind of brought you to where you are today. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's not the money. Um, that's not why I do what I do. Um, yeah, I am local though. So I, yeah, I was born and raised in the same house my parents live in now. So I grew up, grew up in Southwest County in Roanoke, Virginia. And um, honestly, I, I don't think there's anything special about me or my life or anything like that other than the fact that, you know, by God's grace, as with all of us, I, I think he begins to challenge and convict and grow us. And for me, I think a lot of my story actually, um, you know, even growing up in Roanoke, I would say it, it is God's grace that I grew up in a Christian household. But I, I do think there's also a lot of elements in which uh, there's a lot of things I didn't see growing up because I, I had a wonderful, uh, you know, upbringing, middle class, uh, all those things. And, you know, I think as I was growing, as I was getting older, um, I think I began to see different things where I said, oh man, I've, I've never thought about this before. I never knew people lived like that here. I never knew that there was this issue that people might struggle with there. Um, and by the time I got to college, I wanted to go be an international missionary. I read, went on lots of mission trips. Uh, I read some missionaries, you know, Jim Elliott, who went off and, and lost his life actually. Um, in missions. And um, the thing was, though, as much as I cared about that, I saw missions more as a trip than as an actual way that one lives their life. And I saw the church as kind of just a little bit of maybe kind of a, a place where weird, kind of weird people go. You know, I didn't really see the church as something that could actually change anything. I thought maybe Christian nonprofits would be the answer for that. Um, but, but the church, what difference can the church make? in their own community. So I went to seminary and I studied, I, I learned Hebrew, I learned profound theological truths. But at the end of the day, the biggest thing that God taught me while I was in seminary is that he has called his church, his local body of Christ to change the communities they are in. And that is how Christ will change the world. And I wanna be a part of what does that really look like not just a, hey, I come to this little gathering on Sundays, I go home, I do it again the next week. But what does it really mean to be a part of the local church? Um, and so that's kind of what led me um, eventually to World Relief. So um, just a little overview, uh, kind of 10,000 foot view of World Relief. Uh, we are an organization that uh, we've been around since uh, for over 75 years. Um, we started right after World War II, actually, in a response to the devastation in Europe. You can imagine all the displaced peoples after World War II. And what drew me to World Relief, though, is our mission is in to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. Really, in a world that we would say is often focused on quick fixes, we really want to focus on, on lasting change. What does it really mean to bring lasting change, but to do that through the local church? Um, I, I always say at World Relief, we make really great t-shirts. They're super comfortable. They're ethically sourced. I wear one all the time. But at the end of the day, we are not an organization that wants everybody to know World Relief's name. We want them to know the name of a neighbor from a local church who knocked on their door and reached out to them to love them. Um, and so we get to work actually both uh, around the world. Uh, so we work kind of in four major areas, uh, extreme poverty, um, violence and oppression, violence and oppression uh, with refugees and displaced peoples and in disaster response. And in any time when we're working, 
uh, in these areas, we're always asking, how do we help the church be the one that responds? Um, but we also get to work in the U.S. We resettle refugees and immigrants. So you can imagine the past few months have been quite busy uh, with everything going on in Afghanistan. And so we get to, you know, I would really say kind of work both at the, the fruit level. When we see refugees and immigrants come, they're the fruit of a root cause that's happened abroad. But we also get to work at the root level in saying, how do we stop this from happening in the first place? Um, and, and a good example of this, I think, just to tell a little story. So I, I have a coworker, and his name is Dermomo. And his story really hits me because Amy and I, we have lived uh, in Baltimore for five years. We finally feel like we're comfortable in our house. And um, I can't imagine having to, to leave that house in the snap of a finger. Um, but Dermomo, he grew up in the country of Sudan, and he is a believer. And as he was a teenager, um, he saw lots of violence that was coming specifically against Christians. Sudan is a primarily Muslim country. Um, and he told, he told us, uh, Dermomo said that he knew war. War is in his DNA. When he was born, he knew war. When he left, he knew war. Um, but one day while he was in Sudan, he heard that there was going to be a raid on his village. And so what does a, a teenage boy do but runs to his dad? And he comes up to his dad and he says, hey, what are you going to do? Can you protect me? And it, it killed his dad, but his dad looked him in the eyes and he took a deep breath and he said, I cannot protect you from this. And so at that point, his dad said, you need to flee. And so he did. He took off and he ran and he finally got over the border. Uh, he finally ended up uh, in the country of Egypt, actually, which you were just mentioning with missionaries. And so in Egypt, uh, as a young man now, he was trying to figure out how, how to live, you know, didn't speak the language, didn't understand the culture. Um, he was working various jobs just to have a place to sleep, um, just to be able to survive, to have the next meal. And uh, one day he got a call uh, four years later after he was very used to the bustling streets of Cairo. And it was from the United States. And they said, you are eligible to be resettled here. And he was so excited. And so he got on a plane and he arrived in Chicago, and he was very excited to be there, but he was very kind of weirded out and kind of creeped out by it because he landed and he was drove, driven out into the suburbs of Chicago. And he said, I didn't know what to do. It was quiet out there. <laughs> Nobody was out on the streets. And the other interesting thing is he actually arrived on October 31st. <laughs> And so if you're thinking about that, uh, they do not celebrate Halloween in Sudan, just so, just so you know. And uh, he was terrified. Um, and, you know, then on top of that, though, in a very serious way, the next questions that he had to ask are, how do I make friends? I don't know anybody. I don't have any family. How do I learn the language? How do I get a job? How do I get plugged into community? And the person that came to his door was a person from a local church who said, we're here to help you to walk through life with you. And that is really what our mission is at World Relief. How do we help the body of Christ fulfill the calling that Christ has given his church, both here in the United States and overseas at the same time? So, yeah. That's great. I'm only going to need three questions, I think, this morning. <laughs> uh, the piece that you said about empowering, equipping the local church on site to carry on the mission. Talk a little bit more about the challenges of that. Are, do you ever get disappointed that you do something and they drop the ball and like, okay, from now on, we're going to do it. Or, you know, talk about the challenges of that. So on the disappointed question, the answer would be all the time. And when I say <laughs> that, I don't just mean over there. I actually probably mean more here too. And aren't, aren't we all as parts of a local church, aren't we all familiar with disappointment? But isn't that also kind of the beauty of the fact that we have been saved by grace and we get to, we get to walk through life together as family, right? Um, and so, yes, disappointed. Uh, Amy knows. I come home and I vent to her sometimes. Um, but at the same time, so blown away um, by what the churches are doing, both in the U.S. and abroad. Now, I, th I think it's important, though, to, to realize that there's a few things that are really important to the way that we work. Um, so the first thing uh, about the way that we work internationally is we unite churches to work together across denominations. That is much of an issue abroad as it is here. You can imagine 
again, if we said, hey, we want every denomination in Roanoke that's a Bible-believing Christian church to work together, sure, there are some ways that it's probably happening a little bit here, but it doesn't happen easily. Um, so we believe, though, that's so important in these countries because when they work together, they have so few resources. Many of the churches don't have buildings, but then they can begin to learn to work together based on their unity in Christ. Um, they may not agree on baptism. They may not agree on the structure of a church, but when they can agree on the basics of the Christian faith, they can do a lot together. So that's one that's really important. Another thing that's really important, though, when working with churches abroad as well as here is beliefs. Um, at World Relief, we really focus, uh, we look at Jesus in Luke 6. Jesus says in Luke 6, a good tree will produce good fruit. Now, anybody could go up to a, a tree outside here and you could take some beautiful apples that you got at the nicest farmer's market and you could tape those apples on a tree and you could say, this is a beautiful apple tree. But they're not going to last for very long. Eventually, they're going to fall off. They're going to rot. And so at World Relief, we're always saying, how do we focus at the root level? If we do not address harmful beliefs, we will not make lasting change. And too much well-meaning development work goes in, comes in with an exciting new program, says, look what these people are doing, and then they leave and everything goes right back to the way it was before. And this is so important. It's important for the church in the U.S. as well. Um, one really chilling example of this, I think, we started working in the country of Rwanda after the genocide in 1994. Now, if you were a missions organization in 1994, what you would say about the country of Rwanda is, wow, it is in a great spot. 90% Christian. But before the genocide happened, what you saw is on Easter Sunday, the weekend before the genocide, 90% of the country of Rwanda gathered together in churches and worshiped together. And the next weekend, they picked up their machetes and 1 million people were killed within the period of 100 days. And what you have to ask yourself is, what is, the, what is missing? There is a belief problem that is not connecting. So when we're working, we always want to get at the belief systems first. And that takes time. It is messy because what is it? It's discipleship. And that's what we see here in the U.S. as well, how important discipleship is. And another thing that's important, I think, um, in working with churches is we always want to tie together word and deed. I will go to churches and talk sometimes, and some churches say, are you, are you proclaiming the gospel because that's all we care about? And then other churches will say, all we care about is that you go and do some good stuff. Ah, you don't really need to proclaim Jesus. And what we say at World Relief is he's called us to do both, actually. We go and we do good deeds and we proclaim the gospel. We never pit them against each other. Uh, there's a kind of a, a theological, um, you could say, definition for what we uh, hold very closely at World Relief. It's called integral mission. Um, there's kind of a, a theologian for World Relief. He's a South African man who um, came up with this term. It's called integral mission. And I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, but to some degree it is, is ordinary people as the church, seeing people as Jesus saw them, proclaiming things and teaching things that Jesus taught with the motives that Jesus had and the outcomes that Jesus desired. And every single aspect of that is so important. Um, and so again, these are some things that are very important as we're doing this work. But as we do though, we begin to see just incredible things happening. I'll, I'll tell another, another little story. I was, um, I was in the country of, of Jordan and uh, so you, you all know about what happened in Syria over the past many years. And I got to go to Jordan. Um, I don't know how excited my, my parents were about me. I was, I was, you know, 20 miles away from the Syrian border. And um, we were working with local churches. Uh, there aren't a lot. We mapped out every single above ground uh, church in the country of Jordan, as well as some of the underground churches. And uh, we wanted to help them minister to Syrian refugees. And I was, got to go visit this Syrian refugee family. And it was a heartbreaking story. We went into their house. This man was a, uh, he, he had a whole business back in Syria. Actually, people in Jordan said that they used to go vacation in Syria because Syria was beautiful and green and mountains. But then after the war broke out, it was, most of the country was devastated. And uh, this Syrian man and his wife, they had kids. And the way he made money was he would go out every morning and he'd find the trash in the ground and wood scraps, and he would try to make things out of the trash and sell it. That was how they uh, made a living. 
because uh, they didn't have anything else. And um, as we were sitting there with them, um, we began to talk and he began, they were sharing coffee with us, everything they had. It was very strong coffee. It was kind of hurting our stomachs, but you can't turn it down when they continue to give it to you. And um, as they were talking, they, um, a lot of Syrian refugees that came across the border, they'll wear a key and the key is the key to their house. And I don't know if you can imagine if you had to leave your house, but they'd wear it and they'd say, this is the key to my house. I'm going to go back there someday. And uh, they were talking to us and the man told us, he said, hey, we live in this, this village. And we knew that village doesn't exist anymore. Um, they said, oh yeah, we've been trying to contact our family there, but we knew that their family probably wasn't still alive. Um, and as we were talking, um, what he told us is he said, I don't know why these people are doing it, but these, these Christians in Jordan are loving us in a way that we've never been loved by anybody in our lives. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we want to help the church do. Um, and it was at a, a risk to some degree for the Christians in Jordan to step out. Um, so anyways, that's a little bit more kind of on that front. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, back to the t-shirt thing. A lot of people go on mission trips, come back with a t-shirt. The challenge is how do you bring back the concepts and the passion that you experience on the mission field, how do you bring it back to Baltimore? So uh, this is opening the door for you to talk here a little bit about sort of you and Amy's intentional choices in Baltimore and kind of move us into that segment of your life. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll start, I'll start at the mission trip side of things, and then you might have to pull me back to Baltimore because that's where I want to go. Um, so... <laughs> Before six o'clock tonight. Right? True. Before, yeah. I, yeah, I'm trying to drive back and make it in time for the Super Bowl. So, um, anyways, um, yeah, the mission trip thing. So, mission trips can be good. Mission trips can be very useful. Mission trips can also be very damaging um, as well. Um, but honestly, I was, uh, the Lord used a mission trip to Nicaragua for me to, to really grow my heart for people. Um, I think something that's so huge as we go on mission trips is to realize that we're, you know, we're not just giving, but we're receiving. So, what are we learning? What are we learning as we're going on mission trips? Because at the end of the day, if you go on a mission trip to anywhere around the world, you might be so passionate about that place. But if that's not where you live, as of that day, that isn't where God's called you. He's called you to be right where you are. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what job you're working, how useful you think you are or you aren't. God has called you to be where you are. And if he moves you, then he's called you to be there. Um, so I think one thing on the mission trip front um, is understanding and bringing back learnings that we have from the spot that we visited. Uh, we had a team in Seattle actually go to Haiti, um, and they sent a team just to learn from the Haitian church, literally not to do any work for them. They didn't build any houses. They didn't pay any fences. They said, we have a poverty as it relates to the way in which we love people in our city of Seattle, and we want to learn from the richness that the Haitian church has with the way that they love each other. Mm. And so they went just to learn. And they came back and they have applied that and they have seen a lot change. Um, and I will say, and, and then I'm going to move on to, to Baltimore uh, a little bit too. I, I think we do need to realize when we care about people over there, um, there are things, systematic things that maybe affect the people over there that maybe we believe here that we could, we could grow in. Um, for instance, with Syrian refugees, um, you know, at that point, by the time I was going, Syrian refugees were no longer allowed to, to come to the United States. Um, and so we're going over to serve them, but at the same time, we're not allowing them to come here. And so as it relates to the belief thing, I think we always need to challenge our own beliefs. Um, there, there were some surveys that were done, even as it relates to just views on refugees. Lifeway Research did some surveys back in 2015. Um, and as it related to, to white evangelical Christians, they came back with 69% that said that they saw the arrival of a refugee would be primarily a burden or a threat to them, while only 42% said that that was going to be an, an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. Um, and I think that this is why the church, you know, should be leading the way in discipling us. The Bible, the scriptures should be um, what is informing what we're learning about God's heart for his people. So that's, that's a big thing, I think, as well. That's good. Yeah. That's good. The whole Haiti trip thing. Yeah. Go learn from them about how to care for the poor. 
So Baltimore. 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 <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a journey. I mean, Amy and I, we moved to Baltimore five years ago. Um, neither of us are city people uh, or were city people. We are now, I guess. Um, and uh, the Lord moved us there. We were excited to kind of come and learn. And I, I mean, I would honestly say for, for us, the biggest thing about Baltimore, we came with a lot of perceptions and God has probably squashed most of those uh, and humbled us as we learn from the people in Baltimore. And then from that, we learn how to serve them. Um, so yeah, happy to kind of dive, dive deeper there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just moved into the suburbs and commute in an hour to the city? <laughs> we moved into the city. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, did, we were thoughtful with where we moved in the city. So, um, you know, again, God has called all of us to be where we are and not everybody needs to live uh, in, you know, some certain special spot to do mis ministry. But we do believe, you know, like Christ says, if, if you'll follow me, take up your cross and do so, you know. Uh, and so we desire to do that. And so we've, we live in the city. Um, and Baltimore is a very divided city uh, in many ways in the sense that uh, there are a lot of inequalities in the city of Baltimore. There are neighborhoods you could live in in Baltimore and you could feel like you were living in the suburbs and you could have it nice and you could just avoid any kind of messiness, any kind of unwanted thing. You could have, go to... Whole Foods for your groceries every day and do all of that. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there are a lot of places that, that aren't so much like that. And so Amy and I wanted to live somewhere that was not going to be far away from, you know, what we would say the real experience that a lot of people have in Baltimore um, in the day in and day out. And so um, that's kind of how we chose our neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. in the city. So, yeah. We, when we were talking on the phone, we were talking about the little, uh, analogy of are you walking south or are you walking north yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us about yeah about that street yeah yeah so you know we're still learning uh about how to do ministry in in baltimore and what does it look like to be present um so we live in a kind of a a neighborhood that is on the border of three different communities the way baltimore is i don't know if it's here as much in roanoke but like everything's a neighborhood like there's this neighborhood and there's that neighborhood. And each neighborhood may only be like 10 square blocks, but they're very proud of what neighborhood they are. And um, so where we live, it's, it's near this big, beautiful park that we love and we enjoy. Um, and, you know, we can kind of choose which way we want to go when we go out of our house. If you walk south, um, you walk towards the fancy coffee shops, the nice restaurants, uh, the house values go up and up and up and up as you go south. And as you go north, if you're just a few blocks further north from where we live, the house values are a third or less or less or less. There aren't coffee shops that are the same types of things that I would normally just want to go to to study. There aren't, you know, fancy restaurants and things like that. Um, and so I think as we're thinking about intentional living, the question is, is, is you know, I could, always, I could always just go out of my house and walk south. I could just go and say, hey, this is easy. This is where I'm naturally drawn to. I like these things. I like that food. I like that coffee. But at the same time, if I did that, I would be ignoring a whole other part of my community that God's called me to. And so for me and for Amy, you know, some of the things that we do is say, hey, I'm actually going to go walk north. I'm going to go on a walk. I'm going to go to the park three blocks up. You know, I'm going to go, you know, even though that there's, yeah, just things that maybe wouldn't always seem as desirable. But what we've realized is as we do that is it's actually quite beautiful up there too. Now there may be police officers who are stationed out there more. There may be this, that, or the other going on. But at the end of the day, um, we really believe that God has called us not only to care about, um, you know, just being where we are, but to care about those who are more marginalized. Christ always focuses on marginalized groups in his ministry. And so how do we also do that? Well, part of the way is just to be around them. Um, so another big thing we do is we just sit outside. We have a bench on our front porch. You sit out there and you watch the world go by. And you talk to whoever comes by. Um, this, this is, you know, what ministry looks like, I feel like, in so many ways. Great. So. Tell us a little bit about Amy's. She has a master's in public health. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about what, what that looks like in the city? Yeah. So Amy, yeah, she works uh, with, with the city for an initiative called Be More for Healthy Babies. Uh, she has her master's in public health and really is focused on reducing the infant mortality rate in the city of Baltimore. Um, again, there are massive inequalities in the way in which people receive care and treatment in the city of Baltimore. Um, and so Amy is always focused on connecting uh, and her work is connecting those people who are overlooked, who are marginalized 
to the services that they can receive. Um, and it really is so important. You could, um, you know, as you look at the city of Baltimore as a whole, you could put it on a map uh, and you could look back at the way that the, the whole city was redlined, uh, which shows how people of color were not allowed to receive home loans um, in all of these neighborhoods. If you put that map up and you look at it to this day, you can still see the poverty that has come from that. Um, and in Baltimore, people, you know, people are, will oftentimes focus on the areas that are nicer and are easier. Even with church plants, when people come in and want to plant a church, they'll plant a church in kind of the nice part of town, the hipster part of town, the cool part of town. Why? Because it's easier. Um, but so often we are not called to just go where it's easier. We're actually called to come and learn and see what God's doing in places that maybe we would have never considered. And I think a big uh, example of this is the church that we go to. Um, so we're in a neighborhood, um, it borders the Sandtown neighborhood. I don't know if you have heard of Freddie Gray uh, in Baltimore City many years ago. It's the neighborhood that he grew up in. Um, the average household income in the neighborhood where our church meets is under $16,000. Um, there is a lot of, there are a lot, plenty of issues and plenty of different uh, reasons why somebody might say, I'm not going to go move in there. A lot of people in our church have moved into the neighborhood. They've bought houses there. They live there. Um, you know, there's a woman from our church. Her name is Aisha. She grew up in Baltimore. She's already seen all of that stuff. And she said, all I want to do is get as far away from that as I can. But her and her husband felt convicted to say, no, we're going to move into this neighborhood. They spent their whole life saying, we're going to get out of this. And they finally decided we're going to move into this. From their house every morning, they can look out their window and see the corner boys selling drugs. But they realize, you know what? Those corner boys selling drugs need Jesus. I have another friend named Mike Roach who does the same thing. He, uh, he's a big guy. He's, you wouldn't want to mess with him, but he has a couple creative things that he does. One thing he does is he stands outside, he brings his boxing gloves, and he goes up to the corner boys and he says, hey, you want to learn to box? And he boxes with them, and he draws crowds, and he builds relationships. Mm. Um, he brings his Xbox outside and plays video games with people. Um, and what that has led to is that they've actually invited people, and they have two young kids, they have invited these people into their house to come and dine with them. And you might say, man, that sounds dangerous. But the, and and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying to be unwise, but this is what Jesus did for us. We were the people who were on the outside. And what does the word say when Jesus gives the example of the banquet? It says that we're to go out and invite people in that we might dine with Jesus. And so this is a picture of the gospel. Uh, this is a picture of what we're called to. And so this is the type of ministry we're doing in Baltimore. Our church has a whole, uh, a nonprofit that focuses on that. We do jobs training. We do drugs addiction ministry. We do all sorts of different work, all saying we want to raise people up in the city to go then and plant more churches in the neighborhoods that are often overlooked, that face the most challenges, the most difficulties, because we want to see the city thrive. And we believe that when churches are there and they care about the community, that's how we see the well-being of their cities come. So, Excellent. Uh, is your church involved in refugee resettlement at all? Um, our church is not directly, um, but, um, yeah, but yeah, Amy and I obviously are really quite involved in that. And um, yeah, we, we haven't seen a lot on that side of town of refugees coming, but um, we are always looking for ways in which we can, can do that kind of ministry as well. Andrew, I found your comments already this morning. Extremely challenging, thought-provoking, but is there any final word? You're, you're a native. You're a Roanoke boy. You're looking at a bunch of Roanokers out there who are sitting comfortably on a Sunday morning. Anything you would say to us to challenge us a little bit along the lines of what you've been sharing? Yeah, you guys are lucky there's Super Bowls today because I have a lot. <laughs> I get excited. Um, so keeping the Super Bowl in mind. Um, no, but seriously, I would say... I'm going to say a few things. Cut me off if I keep going too long because I do get too excited. Um, as it relates to intentional living, um, I just, I'm just i going to give you a couple overview, a couple thoughts, and a couple scriptures. Um, intentional living, again, we, Amy and I have not figured it out, and we're not special. Like I think that's the biggest thing is we are just like all of you, and we're all just called to follow Christ in these ways, right? Um, but the first thing with intentional living, I think, is it's going to be messy. I think especially as, you know, me as just kind of 
you know, middle class roots, you know, I'm an achiever, I want everything to be nice and proper, and I want everything to be neat, and I want everything to have a nice little bow tie on the end of it so I can say, oh, look what God did. He finished. Okay, now I can move on and accomplish the next thing. But that's not how the gospel works as Jesus works in our lives, and that's not how intentional living works. We have to be okay with ministry being messy, very messy. Um, Second of all, uh, this is also convicting to me because I uh, tend to be an achiever or a performer. Um, We need to have margin in our schedules. How often on our to-do list is our to-do list so full of things to do that we don't have time to do what God might want us to do? We might be just going about our day. Do we have margin that we build into our life so we are open to where the Spirit leads and open to seeing the people around us? Um, and, and that kind of builds into, I guess, my, my, third, uh, my kind of third thought, which would be um, that we do it together. This isn't something that we all go out as kind of rogue Christians and say, I'm going to reach the world in this way. And you're going to reach the world in that way. Um, even here in Roanoke, what does it look like for groups of people at core who are passionate about certain things, who are gifted in certain ways to say, we're going to come together and we're going to read these books and we're going to listen to these podcasts and we're going to figure out what's going on in this area of our community that we've never thought about. And you know what? We're going to figure out what God's calling us to do. And then we're going to go and do it. What does it look like to do that together? Um, because we are a body. We're, we're the family of God. We get to do these things together. Um, and then my, my kind of final thing would be intentional living is not so much a product of strategy as it is a product of theology. And you might say, all right, Andrew, what do you, what do you mean by that? When we hear the word theology, we think, oh, seminary, Greek, Hebrew, justification, sanctification. Here's what I mean by that. Theology, knowledge of God, of who God is. Our intentional living, if it is driven by strategy, will always end up turning into programs that quite often aren't going to impact the people around us. But if our intentional living is driven out of God's heart, first of all, for who God is, and second of all, for who God has created people to be, everybody in his image, then we will actually be able to do sustainable ministry. Here's an example. Amy probably told me not to say this because it may not make sense. So if it doesn't, then she was right. Um, (laughs) You know, in in my work at World Relief, I see people get excited about things all the time because you know what? The biggest, the next big thing is in the news. And then two months from now, the next big thing will be in the news. And then two months from now, the next big thing will be in the news. And I get so frustrated because what, what happens is we just move from thing to thing. And it's kind of like, so Amy and I have this little tree pit out front of our house. Uh, There's one tree in it, and we take care of it with pride. We grow plants, and so we had an idea, we're going to get a bird feeder. So we got this bird feeder, and we filled it up with bird seed. We put it out there and hung it in the tree, and there were no birds. A week goes by, still no birds. And then one day we look outside, and there are, like, I'm not kidding you, 25 finches just attacking the bird feeder. And literally within a day all the food was gone. I think so often Christians are like those finches. We come when there's some big thing, and then when it's all gone, we just move to the next big thing. But we are not called to be driven by just the quote-unquote big, exciting thing. We are called to be driven by the very heart of God. This is how we live consistently, not even for just feeling bad for people. That's not our our primary mission. Our primary reason we do it is out of a love for God and who he is. And then we see people. Um, and then as, as we do that, then we see people as Jesus does, you know, in Matthew nine thirty six, Jesus says, he saw them and he had compassion on them. The thing that I think I would want to leave you with is, do we see them? Who do we see? Or are we too blinded by the cleanliness, the busyness, and the efficiency of our own lives to see the people that Jesus has called us to see. Um, And I think that's how we go out um, to do this kind of work. And then one final thought, just to to bring in one one last little bit of scripture. Has anybody heard of the word phobos? So this is the word, uh, it's a Greek word uh, that is used in the New Testament approximately 47 times. And yes, this is the word that we get the word phobia from. 
So, you know, for me right now, I'm thinking about how I'm scared of spiders. <laughs> um, and for all of us, we might think of different phobias we have. That word can be used negatively in the Greek. Um, but in the New Testament, the word phobos can also be a positive word. Um, it is also means a reverence, an awe, a fear. And in the book of Acts and in the Gospels, the word phobos, every single time it is used is in the positive sense. And it is for a fear or a reverence or an awe of who Jesus is. If we are driven primarily by that phobos, we won't be driven by what we're scared of, but we'll rather be driven by an awe for the Christ who has saved us, who has emptied himself and has called us to empty ourselves out of the fullness of who he is. So, yeah. Excellent. Great. I want to ask you to pray for us. I want us to stand up. If you want, put your hands out like this because the Lord is at work in our hearts here today. But I want to have Andrew pray for us while our new deacon comes up here and leads the music ministry to get, get ready for one last song. Would you pray for us? Lord Jesus, thank you for the deep encouragement that it is to get to gather with your body, God, here in Roanoke. Um, as is the prayer that I've heard uh, ended so many times uh, here at CORE when I've come to visit. Lord Jesus, I thank you that these people's home is here. God, and that they are called to this place. God, and I thank you that people are meeting um, together here, but then going out into normal life. Um, but we thank you, God, that as we go to our normal life, you haven't called us to be something special, or as Tom said, to have some successful spirituality, but that you have called us simply to be present, to be where you've called us, to know your heart. God, and from that, to open our eyes and to look out and to see, God. And we know that as your word says, God, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Lord Jesus, would you develop in this body more and more workers, God, who have the vision to see that you desire to do a great harvest, God, um, in their families, in their neighbors, in their neighborhoods. God, and among overlooked populations in this city, Father, who are waiting for people who love you to come and to love them in your name. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would continue to do a mighty work um, and just encourage us, God. It can be hard. It can be messy. Um, Father, we just pray for perseverance. And Lord Jesus, I thank you, um, God, that your word says um, in Colossians 3.12 to put on as your beloved, God, a heart of compassion. Would you give us this morning a heart of compassion that sees people as you do? It's your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. That was terrific. Glad you were with us. Um, I'm going to ask Prina tonight or tomorrow to send out his email address. So if you want to follow up, get in touch with World Relief or the, their work, uh, Prina will send that, that out to you. Okay? Let's do our last song here. I'm trying to get the word wow out of my brain. That was amazing. Thank you, Andrew. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flows deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my 
sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. My hope is found here on holy ground. Here I bow down. Here I bow down. Here arms open wide. Here you save my life. Here I bow down. Here I bow at the cross. At the cross. I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. 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 Jesus Here my hope is found here on holy ground here I bow down here I bow here, arms open wide, here, you save my life, here I bow down, here I bow down, here, my hope is found, here, on holy ground, here I bow down, here I bow down, here, Arms open wide here, you save my life, here I bow down, here I bow down. Amen. Thank you all, church. Go now to the benediction. We've been called together to worship the living God. We have received freely. He has made known to us the path of life. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our only hope as we return to our vocations is in you, O Lord. Enjoy the Super Bowl.
sir.